Well, good evening, everyone. I think we'll probably get going now. We're still waiting for a few few people to join the webinar, um, but uh, they can they can join in as uh, and they won't miss too much at the beginning. Anyway, welcome to this evening's introduction to the Burgundy 2021 Vintage. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Jasper Morris, MW, author of Inside Burgundy, the, the Burgundy Bible, I think. Um, local resident, of course, in, in Burgundy, up in the Oak Coat. And, of course, um, author of the subscription website of the same name, Inside Burgundy. And, in fact, before I forget, Jasper, perhaps you could just mention to to everyone listening that uh, how they subscribe to the site and indeed when your notes will be coming online. Uh, thank you, Jason, and good evening, everybody. Um, yes, so uh, I would obviously be thrilled if lots of people who don't currently subscribe do join us. Um, so it's Inside Burgundy, www.insideburgundy.com. Costs £95 a year. You can subscribe uh, from that link. And I am busy, still tasting. I still have another week or 10 days of tastings to go. Then on December, throughout December, I scribble away furiously, get all the notes out. We'll probably do Chablis first and Cote de Bone. Typically, I can get both of those done before Christmas. And then Cote de Nuit and other bits and pieces come through uh, between Christmas and the new year. The idea being to have everything ready for the sort of big buzz about Burgundy in January. How many domains do you think you taste that in total? Uh, just for the Cote d'Or, it will be just over 200. Uh, so, yeah, almost as many as you work with, Jason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, and then there's Chablis and other places too. So, yeah, I'm a busy boy from 1st of October through to um, end of the first week in December when it's uh, 8 a.m. starts to get tasting and so on through the day. Well thank, well, thank you for finishing a little earlier than normal in order to join us uh, this evening. Um, can we? Can, can I first begin by asking, well, actually, let me just say, to, if, if people have any questions, p please do use the question and answer and the chat thing, and we will endeavour to get to the questions as we go through the evening. Um, and feel free to, to add any comments as well. Um, Jasper, as, as someone who's obviously full-time living in Burgundy now, can you just talk us through the weather throughout 2021, because it obviously it played a hugely crucial role in shaping the vintage. Yes, and I think it's fair to say that if you talk to any producers during the 2021 season, they were absolutely demoralised and exhausted, uh, which was true also in 2016. Uh, but in 2016, things turned out quite well. And, um, and uh, we will talk about how 2021 has turned out. Uh, so it began with that. It was actually very warm in, in February, um, where we are at sort of up the hill from the vineyards. We actually ate out uh, at home at lunch, um, just sort of sitting outside more often in February and March than in any other months of the year, because it uh, it was then miserable for a while, or when it got hot, it got too hot. Um, but February was nice, and March as well. And then the last week in March, this was as much the problem as the cold temperature, but the last week in March, it was really warm, um, I mean almost full summer temperatures. As a result, the vines which had been coming along nicely suddenly leapt into action and at least the Chardonnay, which is always the earlier of the uh, colours, um, started to bud. It pushed the buds out of, to begin with, the buds are there, but they're sort of hiding within, they call it in the cotton, en coton, within the cotton. Um, so they're protected from the external weather. And the Chardonnay came out and maybe a few early Pinots. So the last thing you wanted after that was a cold snap. And guess what? We got that. And we got it not in the old style form of a spring frost. That just means the temperature gets cold. And uh, if you're in a frost pocket, you will get frosted. And if you're in a, uh, a more open place, you won't. But instead, it was one of those things which has happened before and will happen again, um, which is a mass of freezing air comes down from the Arctic because normally the, the sort of the not quite trade winds, but the currents, the wind currents, which normally keep all that cold air up in the Arctic, uh, stop functioning. Down it came. And it means that the whole area is frozen. It's not just near ground level. 
because one of the ways you protect is by um, your wind machines, which blow the air around and you get warmer air that's sitting above the cold air. You're bringing down, you're shoving the cold air out of the way, bringing the warm air down, and that helps you, but it didn't work at all this year because everything was frozen. Um, and so the nights, it began sort of early evening of Monday the 5th of April, through to the morning of the 6th. Uh, then between the 6th and the 7th, it snowed as well, uh, which makes matters even worse because when the sun comes up the second morning, uh, then the sun shines onto the snow and gets even more um, sort of projected uh, everywhere. And you get a burning effect as well as a freezing freezing effect. Um, and then the water from the snow has got inside the buds and then it freezes and then it explodes them. And then if you survived that, you had yet another cold night. So basically, this is seriously bad news. And by chance, I was out, uh, I was filming on the Tuesday, the 6th of April, uh, with the guys from 67 Palm Mount. And we were, uh, we were filming with Thibaut Liger Belair, uh, partly in the vineyards, partly uh, in his winery. And so I told the film team, I said, is there any chance you can stay overnight? Because I think it's going to be hairy in the morning. And we got up at four in the morning and we went and filmed in the Côte de Bon, Coton Charlemagne, Merceau, Merceau de Lenny, with the, the candles burning everywhere, with some of the wind turbines, with just everybody trying everything. And unfortunately, it was pretty damaging. One thing, are you okay with me rabbiting on, Jason? Do yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, fascinated and <clears throat> listening yeah. as well. So, One thing we'd learned from 2016, uh, which uh, uh, was that you cry disaster when there's frost, but it doesn't have to affect the quality of the wine. So I sort of tried to keep optimistic. Um, and, you know, a bit later on, maybe we can touch on a few reasons why areas where people suffered less. Um, but basically, um, Chablis got it in the neck, but they have better protection methods because they've been used to it for decades. Um, Cote de Nuit a bit, but not as bad as the Cote de Bone. Cote de Bone, Chardonnay is disastrous. Aligoté opens later, so not so bad, and, and Red's not quite so bad. But it went on all the way further south, even as far as the Beaujolais, but Maconnet got, got, got it badly. But so after be- that, the same thing happened as it did in 2016, was that the weather stayed cold, and it was damp, and so you got a mildew problem, and your vines were weakened. So when people say they lost 75% of their crop, it could have been 50% <laughs> to the frost and then more to mildew. And then you had an oidium problem, and it's very rare that you get both mildew and oidium in the same year, uh, because oidium likes um, sort of hot, dry days and, and cold nights to flourish. Uh, frankly, it was the year of the century, if you happen to be a student of vine diseases. Uh, so <laughs> I'm painting a really ugly picture for now, but don't worry, it will change. Um, and so the season goes on, and it was pretty modest summer through um, May, June. June, also the weather wasn't great um, at the flowering, so that also slightly reduced crop. Um, July, not wonderful. August, mixed. September, there were still some rainfalls, but it did cheer up in September uh, and didn't look quite so bad. Um, So then the usual question, when should we start picking? And in 2021, the dates were reasonably similar. Weirdly enough, they were exactly the same for the Cote de Bonne and the Cote de Nuit. People started almost exactly on the same day. Um, And in Chablis, only a little bit later. And then the question was, did you go immediately or did you wait? Now, the other problem by now is that with the various difficulties of the year, uh, a little bit of rot was beginning. So some people said, help, panic, Uh, we better go in immediately and collect what we can for it's rotten, even though it's not fully ripe. Uh, And other people said, well, we may lose a bit more, but we're going to wait and see if we can get a bit of extra ripeness, uh, which they did. So actually, for the first time for years, I think the people who picked later did better than the pick, people who picked earlier. But broadly speaking, you started either on the 17th or 18th. Um, you'd had a few days of rain beforehand. Uh, then it had dried up. Um, or you started on sort of 23rd, because broadly speaking, it rained a bit every weekend. So it rained on uh, uh, Sunday the 19th, and it rained again the following Sunday. But never too heavily, never disastrously. It's worth mentioning you, 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 you're talking about September, of course, because in, we are, yes. in, in recent years, it's, it's been August, hasn't it? <laughs> well, quite, yes. 
Uh, I mean, in the 1950s, uh, you had two September vintages out of 10 and the rest were October. And in the uh, now, you've got two out of 10 which are September and the rest are August. Um, so, yes, I mean, traditionally, for me, we start talking about dates like this in mid-September. That doesn't feel late. But in terms of recent history, yes, it is quite a bit later. Uh, and that's why it's also the the old saying is vendange to, vendange to, vendange ta, vendange ta, which means that if the vintage is early, then you should pick early within the framework of picking dates for that vintage because they're hot days and you know, you know your sugar levels are going to go off the scale pretty quickly. If it's a late vintage, then it's worth hanging on for, for to get the rightness. So there you go. And so, so, something probably worth mentioning now will, was one air, one thing that was slightly unusual about the frost was where it had most impact, wasn't it? It particularly hit the the, the good parts of, of the slopes rather yeah, than... Yeah, it, hit, it, hit, it hits the bits that never get frosted, as they say, <laughs> uh, because those are the bits which tend to start um, their vine cycle a little bit earlier. So they were the ones most susceptible. So typically, people made most wine in their sort of Bourgogne vineyards down at the bottom of the hill, not too bad in the village, absolutely crushed in the Premier Crews, saved a bit in the Grand Crews because there was more protection there, but otherwise they would have been just as crushed. Um, so Tom's made a comment on, on the chat, but I think we'll come back a little bit later on. We'll be talking about which of the villages to go for. So we'll save that up for a bit later. Yeah, absolutely. And... and what one th one thing I heard quite a bit of were one or two rather pleased vignerons, pleased with themselves that they'd done a, a late, slightly not. later tie. Um, yes. did you... <laughs> that really, that really, really makes a difference. Um, pruning late, um, uh, this is key. So in the old days, traditionally, you were told to start pruning at Saint Vincent, so late um, January and to prune through you needed to have everything done by easter so now that things warm up earlier people have advanced it a bit but also the sort of vigneron who thinks that a uh, sort of a um a suburban garden is the way to make your vines look they like to get out there as soon as they finish the work um and uh, um even even now um sort of early november through to now and onwards you can see them there with their wheelbarrows burning up the cuttings and everything looks neat and tidy this early. I think this is a real mistake. But you can't um, do your pruning entirely in the month of March or end of March. And I will say that there is one vineyard of which uh, I happen to be a co-owner for no reason other than he was a friend of mine and he needed a bit of help financially when he bought the vineyard in um, 1999. And our biggest ever crop since 1999 was 2021. And he hadn't finished pruning when the frost came and he hadn't tied. So you imagine you've got here, you've got your, your shoots, which are sticking up. The shoot you decided to keep is sticking up. The next thing you do is tie it down horizontally. So it's attached to the wire. Now the wire is made of metal. So of course it conducts the cold. And as a result, anything that's tied down gets frozen more easily than anything that's still stuck up in the air. Uh, so we so it was the biggest crop we, we've ever made and it compares for half a hectare we made 10 barrels and in 2016 we made half a barrel from the same surface area anyway uh so yeah pruning late is great there is a slight snag if you prune consistently a particular plot of vineyards very late then you're pruning when the sap has started to rise and that actually is a struggle for the vine it doesn't really like it and if you do it several years in a row you start getting noticeably um, feebler crops as a result. Hmm. So, so I was just asked, why can you not only prune late, but it's partly because it might be dangerous to do it um, consistently, and partly because it is a specialised job. So you can't hire extra people to do it. You've got to do it with your own team. And if you've got 20 hectares, uh, you just can't leave it all to the last half of March. Um, though your friend uh, Cyprien Arlo says he has got for... Um, he had a team of, uh, I think, 17 people pruning their uh, 18 hectares or something, and it took 12 days to do it all. Um, I may have got the statistics slightly wrong, but yeah. he was able to get everything done in the last part of, of March. But he has an unusually high number of permanent workers. G given the amount, I mean, I, I spoke to one of two producers just after the harvest, and they really were incredibly demoralized. Um, 
Uh, so, sorry, just after the frost, not not the harvest. Yes. Incredibly demoralised yeah. because obviously they still have to do all the work throughout the year, um, to, to even though they know there's going to be very little crop at the end of it. Yeah. With that at the That's back of your, to have to do that. Yeah, with that at the back of your mind as well, to then potentially have to make full use of the sorting table and throw away less less good fruit must be incredibly difficult thing to do. Yes, and uh, but but frankly, these days people do understand. So, what they wouldn't have done as uh, would have been to do any sort of subsequent green harvesting. A couple of people I know did do that, um, but typically they wouldn't do that. Uh, but then you absolutely do have to do the sorting these days. Nobody will forgive any off flavors, which was not true back in the eighties when people just said, "Well, that's the way the vintage is," and accepted it. Uh, so yes, um, uh, people did sort. And uh, in the whites, you also have an issue of oidium, didn't really hit the red so much, um, which you need to sort against. I mean, in all honesty, the number of growers who routinely sort their white grapes is very small. Mm. Um, you would do it in a year like 2021. And talking to one of the bigger negotiants, he said, well, we did a bit of that, but mostly we do it by uh, after we have um, pressed the wines, and so they are, the grapes have been pressed. The wine is now sitting in the tanks, uh, out of which we will then take the wine off the solids and do the debourbage, the settling, and put it into barrel. We will then taste all the juice. And we are expert enough to know if there's any trace of oidium, and we will clarify those. Um, so we'll either use much less lees, or we will you know, hit, it, hit it with a pretty powerful filter at that point. Um, so you have got to do that in a year like 21. And equally with the reds, you've got to sort the rot out. Um, I think it was so Alex. Did. They did. Yeah, I think it was Alex Morrow who told me that, he said, you've got to remember that in, in 10 years time, no one will remember the size of the vintage, only whether whether you made good wines or not. So actually the, right. the need to sort is is enormous. Um, yeah. And yes, yes. You, and for goodness sake, with, with the price that is practiced these days in, in Burgundy, you can afford to do this. You can take a hit in one year. And uh, also now at the time that they're um, setting the prices, they do, of course, know what size of crop they've got in 2022. Yes. I'm sure that's bringing the prices down, isn't it, Jason? <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll wait, wait and see. Maybe. Wait and see. Yeah, we'll, we, can, we can bring that in later on, maybe. Um, so, so, so we got the frost uh, damage and the candles didn't really work this year because it was too cold. They did protect a couple of the individual vine stocks next to where the candles were, but they didn't protect the, the whole vineyard. Um, yeah, so tricky. When I when I started tasting um, back in June this year, um, I was struck by the differences in, in both in approach and in terms of ambition as well. But also just in in fairly basic winemaking terms, you know, how much whole bunch, how much new oak, how much pijage, how much extraction. There didn't seem really to be a hard and fast rule at all. Um, one or two winemakers did a lot more whole bunch because they felt it would reduce the acidity naturally. Others didn't feel there was the maturity in the stems to do as much whole bunch as normal. I'm just wondering if we shouldn't approach this by colour and uh, maybe look at the whites first and then do the reds or, yep. um, so we can come back to things like the, the, the whole bunches. Um, but I mean, I think it's a, uh, it's a pretty decent, if not good, uh, thoroughly good wine, uh, not, uh, white wine vintage is what I'm trying to say. Um, but with the stag, but there is hardly any. Uh, so, I mean, the, the whites were uh, out earlier. Um, up in Shabley, um the vintage hasn't turned out how i thought i thought they would be sort of mean and green uh and they're not at all um they're a little bit soft um in in chablis and you basically there you had the choice as to when you picked uh, because they're picking a week later and rot was more of an issue there so you either picked earlier um not quite right but avoided the rot or, or later and you had rot so it's a little bit like 2013 in that respect um, but the but the wines are decent without being memorable, um, and will be nice Chablis uh, for drinking not too distant time. 
But then if we bring it to the Cote d'Or, I found actually the wines were different from my experiences in Chablis, because I always taste Chablis earlier in the year. Um, and that actually is worth pointing out that as time has gone by, the wines have been tasting better. In I mean, it may be that as I'm heading from south to north, I'm heading to areas which were more successful within the Cote d'Or. But I also think that things are, have been tasting steadily better as each month goes by. Um, but the white's pretty impressive. Um, one or two of them are a little bit soft, and then there is a firmer acidity behind. Uh, but most of them taste like um, uh, a good uh, vintage, not going to have the muscle power of a great long laying down vintage, but nor is it. It's it's a lot better, I think, than 2016 for white. Agreed. Because what you had in 2016 was two generations of grapes, and you got a first generation which had been left on the vine while that second generation nearly ripened. So you had slightly overripe first generation, slightly underripe second generation, all picked together. So you've got what I call a sweet and sour effect, which I, I just found you know, uncomfortable to taste. Having said which, a lot of them have, have improved since. But 2016 whites, if you've got them at home, you should be drinking up, I would suggest, in most cases. 2021s are much cleaner, much purer than that. Um, I didn't pick up uh, any significant rock flavours, and I didn't get these, these two generations. Uh, so I think we can have confidence in the wines which will be on the market, but there will be very few of them. Yeah, I, I mean, I found some the, the very, very good ones are really not too far away from 2020. And one or two producers like Thierry Pio of the main Paul Pio actually slightly preferred his his 21s to his 20s. And I don't I don't think he particularly needs to to sell the wines, if you like, in that sense. No, 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 exactly. He, he uh, completely. I mean, I, I had a really super tasting with him and he's one of the people who I most enjoy uh sort of exchanging ideas with because it always is a you know a, a, well an exchange exactly uh, which uh, we don't particularly say when we're chatting with people in english uh, that we're exchanging but uh, in french you very often say uh bien échanger uh, avec vous or avec toi uh, and thierry is always one of the most interesting as well as making fabulous wines um, no, I shouldn't mind if you used lighter bottles, but uh, it's not a, <laughs> another discussion. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he, he's, he's um, thrilled with his um, uh, 2021 whites, and, and so was I. Um, I have the advantage sort of sitting at home and just sort of scrolling down, having a look to see if I can find my tasting notes, but I've lost them somewhere uh, on, on him. Um, and other, others... Others didn't enjoy it as much uh, the 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 season because they remembered how horrible it was to to work through, and you know he's one who spends a certain amount of time in the vineyard. But talking to the Matro sisters, they just couldn't forget how horrible uh, the, the summer had been to work in the vines. So when I turned up there, they said, "Oh, we really hate this vintage." When I tasted <laughs> the wines, I liked them. So you know they, you can uh, <laughs> important not to talk yourself down too much, but. Uh, I do appreciate those who are honest all the way through rather than those who are trying to sell it to you year in, year out, um, uh, whatever whatever the crop is actually like. And on, on the whites, there seems to be a nice mix of a very vibrant, refreshing acidity and perhaps a natural concentration through the very small yields. You know, a lot of people lost between 75 and 85 percent in whites some some wines were not even made at all were they or um yes that, that was interesting between the people who who made um uh, put several cuvées together and those who insisted that they were jolly well going to make every single wine that they could make even if it was half a barrel or a single barrel of some of them i think those people are going to regret it from one point of view is that when they come to do the allocations it's a nightmare whereas if like um uh, in reds, uh, Michel Lafarge, she only made, instead of making five different Volnay Premier Cruz, he only made one. At least it's going to mean that he, he can he can do his allocations rather more easily. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I remember, uh, here's a word that Thierry uh, Pio used. He, 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 he described the vintage as electric, at least the style of the wine is electric, um, which, um, no, he, he, he was absolutely, uh, absolutely, he was felt in harmony with what it, what it, what he produced and uh, he's such a good winemaker 
And um, mo yeah. most people seem to use a lot less new oak and some some none at all in, in 21 as well, particularly for the whites. Particularly for the whites. Um, of course, that's a bit of a problem the following year when they want to use one-year-old barrels. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but apart from that, um, it, it sort of makes sense. And in the Cote de Bain, a lot of people in the reds, much less than the Cote de Nuit. Um, but, but in general, uh, people cancelled their orders or else they kept their orders, but they um, didn't sort of open up the wrapping around the barrels and save them for the next year. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, as, as we're talking about the whites, before we move on to the reds, then it, what's your gut feeling in terms of how the white? I mean, they've evolved so well, especially since the mallows happened, I guess, back in, in May or June, whenever it was. How, how do you see them evolving in bottle? Um, I was just uh, typing an answer to somebody then. So, sorry, still on the whites? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that they will actually be very good to drink surprisingly early. Uh, I think they probably will keep. Actually, I'm going to give much the same answer for, for, for both colours. Um, but I don't see that there's a reason for keeping them. I mean... Where I get upset is when restaurants in the area, they only have got the youngest last two vintages on the list. And at the moment, that means 19 and 20. And that's just awful to have to choose between drinking those. You could just about drink 19s. But it's when you waste the upside is what I mind. And I think with 21s, you will be able to see what um, what's good about them reasonably early on. Um, and I don't see that there's a necessity to keep them. Having said which, the good ones actually will keep, and so it wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be a bad um, uh, result to keep a few things back. But it, it's not going to be necessary. Hmm. I think there'll be very few wines where you actually are going to fail to see things in their use. It just talking about the style of the of the reds for a moment. Yeah. Um, as people, two people, I think who it's probably fair to say both enjoy. Pinot and it's for its purity and its elegance and its nuance, if you like. In, in, yes. in many ways, the the approach that a lot of winemakers took to this vintage has, has been very refreshing. The the, the 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 more gentle extraction, the you know the more pillage as as opposed to um, sorry, more pumping out as opposed, yeah, yeah, as opposed to pillage. Um, uh, was that generally your experience of the wines you've tasted? People were a lot a lot less forceful in their extraction mostly i mean there are two ways of going uh, and there were a few people including a few quite well-known people who said because there wasn't much natural um fruit and the rest of it we actually extracted more or we used more new oak to compensate few but there were some um and um otherwise most people and again, there are there are different levels of doing it. Some no new oak, no whole bunch, <laughs> minimal extraction. Say so we've got a light vintage, let's accept it and make sure we don't pick out anything green. And that's going to be the issue. So those when you go and taste the twenty ones at the uh, Stannery tasting in January, um, have you fixed the date yet? But um, uh, yeah, tenth Tuesday yeah. the tenth. Right. Yes, Tuesday is the tenth. Yes. Um, um, at that point, um, you should be tasting the reds with a view in mind of not just looking at, do I like the perfume, do I like the fruit, but is there something a little bit harsh and green in the tannins, uh, which will um, be a question of somebody having slightly either picked before it was ripe, which in the Cote de Bone on the whole, the wines were not fully ripe in red. Cote de Nuit, they're closer to full ripeness. But um, has anybody managed to extract something that's green, which will become vegetable later on? So those would be things to avoid. But I found very few cases where it is really obvious that they have gone too far. And people really did, um, really did um, manage to do it. Uh, yeah. It, we probably need, to, I mean, I I found the difference between the, the if we're talking about reds, between Cote de Bone and Cote de Nuit was, is perhaps that the the Cote de Bones were arguably more reminiscent of a of a seventeen vintage in the sense that they were focusing a bit more on the pretty fruit 
the sort of accessibility, whereas in the Code de Nuit, perhaps they were looking for a little bit more structure and a little bit more. Um, no, I, I don't think either code is anything like 2017, apart from the fact that they're lighter in colour uh, and will drink earlier. But the style is just completely different because um, 2017 was a pretty warm vintage mm. and a big, big crop. And the reason why they were lighter was because the crop was so high. But actually, it doesn't matter. It just makes makes them accessible. Um, and they they the 2017 red, so if anything, proving nicer than we first thought. Um, I have found it very difficult to draw a direct comparison. Um, I would make an argument a little bit for 2014 when people had to pick a little bit before ripeness because of advancing rot. And um, so you can get a little bit of sort of shrillness behind. Um, I was expecting to find more parallel with 2013 and I slightly do in the whites, but not in the reds. Um, uh, 2007, I've heard, and 2011, they were both very early vintages, which then had uh, wet summers. Uh, and so the wines are sort of lacking concentration, but have some quite pretty fruit and are quite light in colour and for drinking on the whole earlier. Um, I've heard some comparing 2001. And I'm going to please you, Jason, because I'm going to throw in a vintage you might not expect. <laughs> but there is one year in the last 50, 60 years where the rainfall in the summer months averaged out and the temperature in the, southern, uh, in the summer months averaged out for both those parameters is exactly the same as 2021. And it is, roll, drum roll, 2010. Wow. Exactly. You look at all the growers are astonished when I say that, and you were as well. Uh, um, so just occasionally I see a little bit of 2010, um, which though it is sort of been flavor of the month for a few years now, I still I feel gives a huge amount of enjoyment and is just short of a great vintage because I don't think it's going to be a sort of a 50-year vintage. I think 2010s are delivering everything now. Uh, and will continue to do so for a while, but it won't be that long until they start to slide away a tiny bit. And 2021s uh, won't ever be ranked in the great vintages, but, um, you know, they're going to come through pretty well. Um, but they are slightly, um, the word the French are using sometimes uh, is tendre or tender or soft. So um, there's enough acidity behind um, and a few tannins as well, if not, um, as long as people haven't brought out too many of them, um, which give you a bit of grip behind. But the nature of the fruit is is softer in the Cote de Bone in particular, and um, so definitely something to drink early. Um, in the Cote de Nuit, then I think you've got some flavour aromatics which are closer to uh, a very good vintage. Um, but without the, again, still without the intensity of fruit that says we're talking about a great year. I mean, what I found found particularly enjoyable, this, I mean, probably across the, the code, but particularly in the Code de Nuit, was the, the terroir definition um, of, of most of the wines. Um, they really were very expressive. Um, perhaps, yeah. perhaps that, of course, was heightened by, by their vibrancy and, and their acidity levels, which definitely project, projected the, the sense of terroir very nicely, I felt. Uh, I think it is a good terroir vintage, but uh, I would specifically say, though, that it is really true to the classifications, that between generic, village, premier cru, grand cru, you really do go up uh, clear steps each time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I've got, uh, you know my system, as well as sort of scoring out of 100, I sort of have to. I also give things stars out of five, which are relative to where they sit in the hierarchy. So a Bourgogne Rouge with 89 points can get five stars because that's a great Bourgogne Rouge. Um, and I was expecting early on that I was really going to give hardly any five stars, but I have found a few, less than in 2020, of course, but I found some. I mean, we had a question earlier on the chat about appellations that might have done well because of the the slightly cooler nature of the vintage i had pretty strong notes on the chambolles that i that i tasted did you have the same experience uh yes because i think uh, chambol and volnay were mentioned in that in that question on the chat uh and there are two villages which really have not much enjoyed the hot dry years and they're sort of 
uh, back on form rather more, uh, and probably better for Shambol and Donnelly simply because uh, there was less damage um, in in Shambol cross damage. Uh, uh, so yes, we we are back in more classic uh, Shambol terroir uh, for sure. And uh, have you? I mean, even even growers I found were a little bit surprised by the very positive ev evolution of the wines in barrel. Um, yes, there's definitely a very strong feeling that, that I mean, that lots of emitters that we really thought this was a disaster before the malolactic fermentation. And since then, everything came to some sort of balance. Uh, and now we quite like them. And as time goes by, they like them more. Um, so I'm still trying to get my head round as I'm, I'm sort of giving things uh, more appreciation now in November than I did in October, is that really this sort of Cote de Vine, Cote de Nuit divide, or is it more they needed their extra month, as you could be? I mean, one or two people are saying, well, we may bottle a little bit earlier than we would normally to try and preserve the freshness yeah. and the fruit. Is there a danger if you do that, that then you will you'll lose out that extra time of élevage, which we've seen so far has be, had a very positive effect on? No, uh, I don't think so. Um, Normally, in other years, someone who says we're going to bottle early to preserve the fruit, I say, well, why haven't you got more fruit? But the <laughs> fruit is there, but it is quite, it is on the lighter side. And there is a risk that too much, it's particularly, I think, the barrel elevage. If you leave them in barrel too long, they might go a bit over the top. But I mean, most of them are smart enough. They're, they're tasting. They say, OK, now we make the decision. Uh, now seems to be an optimum moment. Um, so a lot of them have made it a bit shorter, but typically, but I mean, hardly anything I tasted was already in bottle. Uh, mostly they're bringing it forward by a month or two months. Um, and I, this seems to me to be right, because when I go and taste, there are some wines which I think, yeah, that seems ready to go, and others. I feel confident now when people ask the question, saying, we're thinking of doing it, what do you think? I feel that I can give a sensible answer as to whether the wines are, are pretty much um, where well, they could and should be. Um, so probably a good thing to do. The other small thing to think about is that if you have a very small cuvee, you've decided you want to try and make every wine, you've got one barrel or two barrels, you don't want to put it into a, uh, a stainless steel tank for the second part of the élevage with one of those floating lids. They're not stable for small quantities. So a lot of people have said, okay, when we've had two barrels, we bottle them straight from the barrel together and we've already done it. So there are a few cubes which normally wouldn't have been bottled. This is particularly the whites, uh, which have gone into bottle for that reason. So I'm comfortable. I think it is a general decision in the Cote de Bone in particular that we're going to bottle a bit earlier and I'm in favour of it. Makes sense. Actually, what a slightly frivolous question. Did you, uh, uh, I came across more what they were terming as wine globes than I, 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 yeah. bit, uh, than I than I'd ever seen before. They they are obviously have a very effective salesman in the area. Do you, do you see any point to those things? There's no oxidate. There's no ox oxygen transfer at all. Yeah. Um, so there's one producer in Whites who celebrated having gone completely that way, which is Arno Art. Otherwise, people use them just for um, an additional option. Um, and of course, they are quite useful. Uh, I'm just looking on your list. Uh, you work with his cousin, but you don't work with him. Um, but there is one person who's started with it, with wood, and whenever he's racked, he's racked to wine globes uh, because it, for this reason of keeping them stable and unmoving um, throughout. Um, you work with his cousin, uh, Roma Kupino. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Otherwise, a very few people have them as a major part of their artillery, but lots of people are playing around with um, jars and amphoras and wine globes and the rest of it. So, can, can yeah. we can we just go back briefly to um, back to onto the red wines though? But what you, you're generally, you know, a fan of of whole bunch. Um, yeah. What was what was your your take on on how it was used in in this vintage? Okay, well, I'll do it two ways. One is what the producers have done. An awful lot of them who normally do some whole bunch uh, have decided, have said we didn't dare to. A, we think the stems weren't completely right. Uh, and B, there's a risk of little bits of rot or oidium being attached to them, which uh, could be unha unhealthy. 
Uh, a couple of people went the other way and used more whole bunch because nobody in Burgundy follows, you know, you never get the whole thing the whole way. I'm just having a glance at your list. But for example, um, Arno Morte, mm. uh, he used um, uh, much more whole bunch this year and on every QA um, because he said, what the hell, uh, wants to do it, wants to try it. Um, and uh, there's a value of the physical presence of the bunches in the vat. Um, and, uh, and I loved on those wines. I thought they were really good. I agree. Um, so many others did a bit but less. Some didn't do any at all. And the, the people who always do 100% still did, you know, still did lots. Um, so the idea is it might be um, the underripeness and or health issues might be a problem. And I had that in my mind when I went and tasted it. Though you, you have to say that uh, anybody who's followed the, uh, the wines of Domaine Dujac since 1969 will realize that Jacques says we use up to 100%, uh, the current generation use a little bit less, but it's still 60 to 80% uh, as it was in 2021 in most of their wines. Um, you know, across the years that Jacques was making wine, he would have had a, a, a huge proportion of unripe stalks and he made some of the most glorious wines you could possibly want. Um, so I didn't worry too much. I found uh, a sweet spot around one third whole bunches and I found the thing which really attracted me is that consistently with the people who did a bit of whole bunch, but some cubes not and others with, I found the length of the wine, the persistence of flavor, just seemed to be elongated with the whole bunch cubes. I, at this stage, I very rarely found it discordant and drying and ugly and green. Um, sometimes uh, one grower who you don't work with, but I know well, um, played around, he, he was mostly at 30%, one at 50 and one at 100%. And he said, I wish I hadn't done that now. And it did taste unbalanced. Some mm. other people with 100%, it's been okay with. Um, so yeah, um, I think it has worked better than people would have feared at the outset. The, and, and in terms of new oak on the red wines, as you mentioned earlier, some people wanted almost to get a little bit more substance into some of the red wines though therefore they didn't ease off the extraction and they didn't necessarily ease off the new oak as perhaps as much as i thought they might have done there were still people uh, using <coughs> probably a mistake in my view but mm. uh, it, it wasn't very many and uh, from memory i can't see any of yours uh, uh the maybe maybe the old one but uh, uh, but there's nobody standing out in that list uh, who, who did that and in terms of we we touched on Chambol and Volney, any other any other villages that that stood out for you? Um, okay, in the white, I think what I liked about Punini, in the same way as Chambol and Volney, is you got back the characteristics that we used to expect from Punini, i.e., a very floral bouquet. So that was a good thing. Uh, and and um, otherwise, no, the plenty of good wines, Mercer and Chassin too. Um, in the reds. Um, I think the Hill of Corton didn't do too badly at all. So it's more attached to the Cote de Nuit um, than, than sort of south of Bern. Um, initially, I was a bit disappointed by Vaughan Romanet because when I tasted from growers who were based elsewhere but had the old Vaughan wine, there was often not a strong point. But what I've tasted from growers based within Vaughan Romanet, I have been more positive about. So, so that's all right. Uh, Sherry Chambertin these days seems to do well in both um, yeah. cold vintages and, and hot vintages, so maybe different parts uh, uh, do well. There's one negative in parts of Chevrolet is uh, that they did get a hailstorm in June as well, uh, and another one in 2022. So the northern part of Chevrolet, the, air, the vineyards around Brochon, um, did get knocked back by that. But it was early enough that it doesn't affect um, quality. It was just yet another blow for the poor old producers. Um, and I haven't yet. Tomorrow I go to Marcinet and Fusan taste with uh, Emily Berto and Sylvain Patay. Um, I haven't got that far north yet. Um, you know, they'll, they'll both be, be nice tastings. I think I've done I've done them both um, so far. I, a side a side question, which has is is in a way is odd to ask this in in a cold vintage after a cold vintage, but I want I, it's something that. When I'm there, it keeps cropping up in my thoughts. 
Do you ever envisage a reclassification of cert certain crews because of the change in climate? So maybe uh, what were considered once vineyards that possibly weren't warm enough to get full maturity are now very well located because they're not getting too hot. I certainly think there is there are there are winners and losers. I wouldn't at this stage envisage any reclassification. I mean, can of worms, but uh, yeah. uh, maybe later on if if all this <laughs> continues uh, further. Uh, Sarah's asked if you think there's less acidity in twenty one than twenty thirteen. I have to say that um, it's not something that they will probably have talked to their importer about. But some of the honest ones who also know that uh, that I don't sort of shop them too much. As well as being widespread chapitalization in 2021, though not excessive, I mean, it really was playing around with half a degree, which I'm, I have absolutely no problem with. Quite a few people will have acidified as well, um, because the the pH le um, levels were actually higher than you would expect in 21. And some people for the balance of the wine or bacterial stability did slightly acidify, not very much, and it won't be won't be ugly or aggressive. Um, but at the moment in the marketplace in general, people take acidifying as pejorative and adding sugar is acceptable still. Um, personally, I think that you do have the right to play around with small amounts in either. And I'm at ease with chapitalizing as long as it doesn't go beyond one degree of alcohol, preferably near a half. Um, and I, uh, as long as you don't acidify wholesale and because your analogist has said the analysis doesn't read right, therefore bung in a few bags of Tartaric, uh, that would be a mistake. But it's just a little a touching up if people want to. I don't mind too much. Well, it certainly makes sense to capitalise if, if there's any risk of getting rot in the vineyards, just to pick that a little bit earlier and add that half a degree of alcohol. Well, to, uh, that... no, I, no, I wouldn't do it for that reason. Uh, I think you need, you meet, need to make the picking decision uh, about what's going to give you the best tasting grapes. It's not so much about sugar levels. Um, but then, chapitalizing has two reasons. One is, could be to bring it up to what the market expects. Um, well, I mean, as long as it's not by very much, that's okay. But the other one, which is valuable, is that if your vinification is going through, your fermentation is going through quickly, by adding the powdering some sugar in at the end, you can prolong it and you tend to get more interesting aromatics uh, uh, that way. And I think just to add sort of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, a load of the growers I talk to, uh, even some really famous names, so they love to do it almost every year, including some of the hotter years, just because they think that um, it's not to get in extra alcohol, it is just to get the best out of the fermentation. Um, so I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but, uh, I'm against chapitalizing in order to bring something up too far. There was one grower I tasted with, he's not one of yours, and he's known for his white wines, but he has a couple of reds. And I tasted with him a red Montley, which he picked at 11.35 alcohol, and he's left it there. And it's just the most beautiful wine. But you want to drink it young. I mean, it doesn't have the structure and body uh, to last, but gosh, it was super. Do you... Do you... Again, we, we may need to divide the, wi ri the wines into Côte de Bonne and Côte de Nuit, but do you feel, um, certainly when I was there in, in November, I found a lot of the wines that really, they changed a lot in the sense that they, they were much more together and therefore very, very expressive and very easy to taste. Do you yes. think they will shut down post-bottling or not? Uh, probably not much. Uh, they're certainly much easier to taste. I mean, that goes through my... My regime which is sort of up to 100 wines a day five days in a week and at the end of friday evening when i'm driving back home i'm feeling fine last year i was tired at the time at the end of most days and certainly by the end of the week um i don't think they will shut down particularly um if they do it'll only be for a short period um yeah so um got a question i, I wouldn't worry about that no yeah Got a question there coming in asking, um, could 21 potentially be a year to go for the grander yeah. wines? Um, well, the only problem is there isn't, there aren't many of them. <laughs> yeah. So low. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but I would certainly look at, um, I would plan to drink 21s before any of 18, 19, 20. Um, but then uh, I mean, there are certain vintages which uh, when I bought them, I'm, okay drinking them young even if they will keep well so i'm 
totally happy drinking 17s now, even though they've got lots more to give. Um, I'm happy drinking 21s. I sort of drank vintages like 11 and 7 early-ish. Um, and but the great vintages there is such a sh it's such a shame if you don't keep them long enough because you waste the the great potential upside so i'm going to keep 18s and 20s in particular for a very long time um and uh 19s probably somewhere in between we had a question about producers who stand up because in five minutes i have the choice of going down and eating some crab tart or getting divorced so uh, I will <laughs> abandon you in about five minutes. Um, and just looking through your, your I, do you want me to do this or would you rather I just said, uh, uh, I say, say they're all, they're all brilliant. No, no, they're don't. all brilliant. Of course they're brilliant. Um, it's always good to have a few steers, I think. Yeah. I mean, um, I would pick out, um, who am I going to go for? Um, well, okay, someone who um, didn't enjoy, at least Natalie, who we meet when we go and taste her, did not enjoy years like 18 and 20, adores her 21s or their 21s. Natalie Tolo, Tolo Bo, uh, I think is a good place to look. Um, the Gouge wines, I think, are very good in 21. And they, in 2020, uh, I had to suggest to them that it was a mistake to have wines of higher alcohol than yield because they're the yields were down around 12 hectolitres a hectare and the alcohols were at 14 and a half. And so this year they've got much better yields than 21 and still not massive, of course, but they're much healthier and the alcohol levels are just right. So I love their wines. Um, uh, oh, yes. And, and I'm really impressed. Um, uh, Pascal Marchand at Domaine Tours. Um, uh, I, I think there's some really good wines there. Um, uh Mark Heismer as always or a couple I loved with um top end of Maxime Schaar at Nola and he again is completely frank and honest about what he's done Katiar 21s are better than the 20s which he overcooked and I think he recognizes that now so I think the 22s are going to be a, a lot better um Lombre lovely Dujet no I mean oh, oh Cyprien Arlo I think gorgeous in 21 there are various others I could mention too. I mean, you know, Morto, very, very good. Um, lo loads of people out. Agnes Paquet, I, I didn't taste all her range, but I like them. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to cite all your names, but broadly speaking, there's a lot to like. They will not be cheap. Um, there won't be much to go around. Uh, but yeah. Um, so I was just asked about Alas Corton 70. Uh, 70 did quite well in 2021 because they weren't frosted as badly as they were in 16. They were still quite frosted. Um, and now that's got on. So Domain Rappe, I tasted with the sun for the first time. Hmm. Um, nice uh, and uh, they, they were decent wines. Um, Alors Corton, I mentioned Corton. Um, Alors is a bit... Uh, should I be nasty about Alors Corton? Or should I? No, I won't be nasty about them. But <laughs> the problem... <laughs> I actually prefer the other two villages, which are part of the Corson Hill that make the Grand Cruz. I prefer the wines in Ladois and Pernod and more to my taste than Alps Corson, where I often find the tannins to be too rough. Um, so, but in general terms, um, uh, around that area, um, uh, not bad. Um, so Steve, on, on the whites producer wise, uh, it's, it, there's no difference from a normal ranking, I would suggest. A um, uh, couple of other favourites um, elsewhere, but all the people who I really like, um, uh, I, I like to get. If you want the real detail from me, then I'm afraid you're going to have to sign up for the website and then get tasting notes. There'll be over 200 producers in 21 and something like 3,000 tasting notes, um, but you can always cheat and sort them by point rating or star rating or whatever. Not that I recommend this. Uh, much better to go and read the tasting notes. Well, that, that um, would be a good time to repeat the uh, the website address, I think, Jasper, wouldn't yeah, it? Well, someone kindly, one of your team kindly oh. put it up on the chat site, but it is www.insidebergundy.com. And and also go and buy the book, if you haven't already. Of course. Sure of most course, people course. already have. Um, yeah. well, look, we, I think we better let you go and have your, your, your crab crab tartlet. 
Um, yeah, I'm afraid that uh, I'm not drinking one of your uh, growers. I grabbed uh, something else in, in a hurry because I realized we we're about to go on air for white. But I have got a bottle of Thibaut de Chevelle's Moulin Vent 2011 uh, sitting downstairs waiting, waiting to be drunk. I like 2011s in the Beaujolais. Good. Well, uh, lovely to see everybody. Um, thanks for, uh, for, for staying with us and uh, enjoy the rest of the um, evening. Enjoy uh, tasting 21s. And I may even see you at the uh, Stannery tasting in January. Great. So, Thank you, Jasper. Right for now. And sorry, I have to abandon show. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Jasper. Um, just to, I might pass you back to Tom, just to say we, we've got um, an interesting schedule of, of releases coming up over the next month or so. And I think we're kicking off tomorrow, Tom, are, are we not with the wines of Charles Van Canet? Yes, Jason, all being well, that, that's the plan. Um, and then later in the week or perhaps early next week we'll we'll we'll, we'll start um with the domains we've got domain rapé as an early release this year um and then uh domain lawny oreo um towards the sort of um second week of december so th three key new um early releases and i think also yeah i think we've, we've got rapé on the sixth uh lawny oreo on the 13th and but sandwich in the middle and um, we're putting together a Beaujolais, uh, Beaujolais offer, and there's some really terrific Beaujolais this year. And then, as as was mentioned during the tasting, we have the the actual sorry during the the webinar, we have the actual tasting on March, March and January, January the tenth on a on a Tuesday from six till eight, I believe. And there's Indeed. still one or two places available as as it stands, I think, Tom. Thank you, Jason. That was a wonderful hour or so. I think we've all learned um, plenty about the vintage. Uh, the take-home message that it's a repeat of 2010. I wasn't expecting that. So there we go. Not Another bad at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Jason and uh, Jasper. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll thank him. Um, but what a what a, a very very fascinating hour. And um, we'll we'll send out our invite for the tasting soon. Uh, we have a, a limited number of places, so um, you'll need to be quick to get to get your catch your spot. But um, um, thank you all for coming, and um, yeah, see you in the office tomorrow, Jason. Yeah, cheerio. Good night.